Okay, sorry to be late. How's everybody doing? How are you? Good. Good. How was the homework? Good. Good. Painful? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said something really interesting to me. They said, I never spent so much time to write so few lines of code. <laughs> <laughs> Do we want to fess up to that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Down that's like a, that's like a yeah. experience. Yeah. Down balance. That's a good one. I experienced that too. Um, oh, it's good for you. Builds character, as they say. Um, I am really sorry that I don't yet have. Um, the second homework I get. It, it should be up by now, and it's not. I'm really, really close on it, but I just am not really there. For some reason, homeworks are taking them a lot longer to together than I would have expected. So, but maybe, maybe, uh, maybe it's, it is to be expected, I guess. So, I, I think I'm really, really close. I think if I don't fall asleep tonight early, I will have it done tonight. But but well, last night, too, the same thing. Like, late at night, I was just sitting at my desk. I was getting old, guys. <laughs> That's what's happening. <laughs> Actually, I have this, this is like weird. I'm not sure I'm about to tell you this, but I have, I have a, I had two hyperthyroidisms. I still have them. They're just not affected because my thyroid is now no longer affected. But I had two hyperthyroidisms, which basically, like for many, many years, I would basically not sleep and just work all night. And it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome until my doctor was like, yeah, this is like really, really unhealthy. But then, but then I did something what seemed really unhealthy, which was to take a, a radioactive pill, <laughs> which killed my thyroid. But it was like, I like, actually like ingested it. So like, this, there's like a generally, you know, it's an iodine pill, so apparently like, the thyroid takes up most of the iodine in your body, so it all ended up there. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but then I don't have thyroid anymore. So then I got old. That's the next excuse. <laughs> okay. So we're starting into part two of this fun history on CNNs, convolutional neural networks. Um, Remember last time we talked about LayNet, a little bit about like what it is and, and how it was the first, it's considered the first modern convolutional network. Um, we talked about um, AlexNet, how it was the first uh, winner of this, the IB or IBLC um, classification competition using ImageNet data um, in 2012. And we talked a bunch about that. Um, we're going to continue on using this timeline of winners as our um, uh, this is like the backbone for what we'll be discussing. So after 2012, so we get our first convolutional network winner of this competition. Everybody's all excited. Everyone wants to know what's going to happen next year. Well, next year, um, quite a bit of improvement, but in terms of the architecture, like not a whole lot of interesting stuff happened. Basically hyperparameters changed from AlexNet. So it's basically Alex, AlexNet, but if you remember in the first convolutional layer, there were uh, there was a large 11 by 11 uh, convolution, so the filter size of 11 by 11, with a stride four. So like, that is just like not done anymore. And um, in 2013, what was used was a seven by seven with a stride two, which is very common now for like a first convolutional layer. So that was, that. so that changed, and then um, the number of filters learned at each of these convolutional layers, they just increased it. So I, you know, I guess a year later they had better GPUs, a lot of more memory, and maybe they could fit more filters in. I don't really know if that's exactly the case, but that, that's likely to be the case. And so they have, you know, this, the network's a bit larger, and voila, they could take the top five error rate from 16.4 down to 11.7. So, like, that's a huge improvement. If you remember, like, just in 2011, it was like 26 point something validation for the um, top five error rate, but uh, so here we are at 11.7. But not very interesting in terms of what, um, just like the innovations in architecture. 
Okay, so, so in 2014, to make up for 2013 not being so interesting, we got two networks that were really interesting and different. Um, there's only one winner for this, for the classification uh, competition, that's obviously one with the lower um, top five error rate, uh, that's GoogleNet or Inception. Um, and, uh, but notable mention, what's that like honorary mention? Uh, second place winner was what's known as BGGNet. And um, it was not, not far behind, but um, there's a bunch of these different contests in this IELTS uh, SVRC uh, set of challenges, and it actually won first place in the localization. So even though it took second place in the classification, won first place. And, and they're both of note because one, they're both interesting different architectures, and two, um, they're both still around. Like people still use these to do stuff. And I, I guess 2014 is not that long ago, so maybe it shouldn't be so surprising. But um, yeah, these are still like in, in, in common use. So let's talk about BGGNet first. So, um, for some reason, like resolution when I come to this projector is just not awesome. So some of these things are probably going to be hard to see. Now, please raise your hand if like somebody is not there and you'd like to have it cleared up. Um, and yeah, so what's BGG? Well, um, BGG basically was an experiment after um, uh, after AlexNet. I was like, okay, AlexNet had uh, this big like 11 by 11 convolution and a 5 by 5 and a bunch of 3 by 3s and then eventually you know a couple of fully connected layers to the softmax loss and that was the network. Uh, there were some pooling, some max pooling layers in between. BGG was like okay look let's just like explore what the, the what the um, what the effect of depth in the network would have and so to to sort of control Everything else, they basically, you can't see them here, unfortunately, but they, these are three by three convolutions. All these yellow boxes, they're just three by three convolutions all the way up. So they only use three by three convolutions in this, um, in this network, including the, the, the very first convolution layer. And uh, there's some max poolings as well along the way. The max poolings were used, they have a strike too, so they were used to do uh, reduction of spatial dimensions in the filter maps. Um, and, but, uh, but other than that, that's, that's it. So, and, and radios, because now everybody's using radios. Uh, AlexNet showed us that radios are awesome, so now everybody uses them. Um, so that's it, and then of course the same um, fully connected layers, uh, dimension 4096, 4096, and then 1000, because of course there are 1000 classes in this, uh, in, the, in the challenge, in, in the, this reduced uh, image net set. Um, I have a VGG 16 and 19 shown there. Um, 19's just, so 19's uh, got a few more layers. <laughs> uh, and three more layers to, to, to be precise. And um, it does, it's just a slightly better, so this is what was submitted to the competition in 19, but it's just a slightly better than 16. Um, so, you know, kind of like a, the result there is like, yeah, we're, we're, getting, we're getting benefit out of depth, but not, not tons of benefit. But anyways, three by three convolutional layers everywhere. And then every once in a while, a, a two by two max pool is right to reduce the spatial dimensions. So, what's the deal with the three by threes? So, why use why use smaller ones and say like eleven by eleven? Thoughts? You need what five max pool and you don't lose as much. Like you still there? You need five max pool and you don't lose as much. What do you mean? It's with, with each filter. You would grab the, I guess, larger value from the. Oh, I see. Like the receptive fields are like yeah. more controlling the smaller. Um, yeah, I mean that, that's that's probably that's, that's probably true. I don't think, I don't think that was necessarily never done. Is it they want to make it faster for this and what the other pieces do? Yeah, basically this is all about like having less parameters. So if you want to go deeper, if you want to have a deeper network, you, um, especially back way back four years ago. Or a five year like when the research was being done, or whatever. Um, like you needed to have less parameters in the current layer so that you could free up memory in your GPUs and, and have deeper networks. So, so like one thing that's just a practical, practical reason of like just being able to want to, you know, getting more layers into the into the same amount of memory. So yeah. Also, it turns out you can use these three, three by three convolutions um, 
to sort of approximate these, these large ones. So, so yeah, so a three by three convolution has a three by three receptive field. Um, but what if happens if you stack two together? So like if you have if you have two layers of three by three convolutions, one over the other, what is the effective receptive field of that? Like if you look, if you're, you know, if you're so like the network's going from bottom up here. By the way, this is like a common way to describe networks is to start like the inputs at the bottom and the outputs are at the top. Or if they're on the side, to go from left to right. But it's not common to go up, like to start with the input up and have the output at the bottom. That's again like using signal wave. You just don't do that. It just shows that you're in, in the group if you do it this way. Anyways, so yeah, so if you have, you know, if you have like these three by threes here, what's the what's the effective size of the receptor field for one of the activations here in this layer? Not nine by nine, but you're thinking, right? Five by five. Yeah, it's five by five. So, yeah, you have these you have these two these two sets of convolutions. The convolutional layers are three by three. If you look at the activation at the, at the end of those two. You go you know you go back one three by three convolution gave you that. But now if you look back one more layer, you know each one of these you just kind of think about having three by three centered at each one of these places and, and, and you know. Like the corresponding corner here, you know, you're filling that like this, this additional like bound border around it. So two three by threes together give you give you the um, same effective receptive field as one five by five, and there's a couple of benefits. Less parameters. One less parameters. There are less parameters. How many less parameters? Is the answer. <laughs> um, yeah. So a three by three has nine parameters. And let, so let's say that we, yeah, so here I have, we're talking about five by, or two together. Let's say we have three together. So each each filter ha, has nine parameters, three, three squared, and there's three of them. So that gives you basically uh, three times three times three, so, so 27. And then C squared there is just like if you have however many channels, that's, that's you also have that number of parameters. But for the seven by seven, or the, yeah, the seven by seven in this case, we stack the three up together, that's 49. So you're comparing 27 to 49. So you have like just over half the many parameters, but also, um, also you get to add. You're, it's deeper. Like you, you have more. Uh, you have you have uh, you have additional layers. In between each of those layers, you get to put another nonlinearity. So if you think about what you're doing here, when you're training these neural networks, you're trying to train, you know, some function to approximate from input to output, and you you get to have it like. This is composed of more and more nonlinear functions, so it's allowing there to be like more nonlinear functions being learned, which is a useful thing because the world's not linear. So if you took all of those pairs of three by three uh, convolution layers and replaced them in the five by five, would you get a similar accuracy, or is having the extra accuracy you mean reduce the accuracy? You're just saying like if I if we took this and made these all five by five, yeah. And what what would happen? Well, um, one of two things would happen. So definitely. Definitely, the training, uh, the training loss is going to go down. The training accuracy and the classification task is going to go up on the training set. You have more parameters on which to like learn the data. Now, one of two things can happen on the validation for the test set. Um, you know, and, and, the, and the, 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 the the value that, that, that the competition uses to compare against is on the test set, not on the training set. Right? So that, that's how we're, you know, um, th that is a way of saying, like, how well do we do on data that we haven't seen before? So two things can happen. One is the effect of having more parameters could actually allow you to memorize the training set in lieu of actually being generalized to unseen data work, like the test set. Or there's just, like, you didn't have enough capacity in the 3 by 3 network, you know, 3 by 3 combination layers. So, like, having additional capacity allows you to learn even more and you generalize better. So, like, it's not clear what would happen on the test set, but definitely in the training set, like you know, your ability to 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 to, to, to memorize that to, to do better on it would be up. Just because you have additional capacity. So can't act just like the regular organization? The, capacity? Yeah. The capacity filter. is yeah, so say the size of the filter can kind of act Yeah, that's right. Filter. Like just the num like the, the number of parameters in your network um, is itself a regularization. Exactly. Remember everything's a regularization. You can like spin it to the parameters. 
So like the capacity set is is a regularization. Um, so yeah, the more the, the the higher the capacity, the greater is your ability to memorize the data, the, um, the training data, and usually that means you're going to do be worse generalizing to other unseen data. So that's why having smaller capacity acts like a regularization. But that's not like that's not like a fix and fast rule. But that's sort of generally right. Okay, good questions. Other questions? Um, yeah, so one thing about BGG, it was massive. It was just, it is massive. So the way this is right now, there's 138 million parameters in, it in, the, in the BGG 16. That's a lot of parameters. That's like a, a lot of parameters. <laughs> yeah. And it required a ton of memory. So the memory requirement here is like in each batch, you know, you you have to hold so many you know images, and then as you as you feed those through your network, you know, each stage your producing numbers have to be remembered. And this had a you know massive requirement for memory as well, um, you know, just for each image. So this is a pretty this is a pretty big network, um, but still it's used quite a bit, it turns out. But it's like implicitly regularized because it's using Um, yeah, this is just pointing out that like in these kinds of networks, just in general these networks, most of your memory is up, it, it, is at the like is near the input, so those early layers, uh, because of course the filter maps, the feature maps are like largest there, and you and, and, and these ones which use a couple of different fully connected layers, those are usually where most of your parameters reside, because you have like an all-to-all -all connection of those fully connected layers, and that can be really big, like you see. You know, there's 138 million parameters. Well, 100 million of those show up just in making the connection from this pooling layer to that to that fully connected layer. So, yeah, pretty massive. Question? Yeah. Um, so, is it correct to say that like the convolutional layers are learning like the features of the images, and then the fully connected layers are like making connections between those features? Yeah. I mean. So like, it would be hard to say what it would be hard to to say what you just said is wrong because it's you're just describing exactly what's going on. <laughs> but I think what, you, what what you're trying to point out is like the job of the convolutional layers is to learn spatial correlations within the image, and as you move up into higher and higher layers, the the, the effective receptive field is larger in the like in the original image. So like you're seeing. You know, at first you're seeing small patches, and you're learning local correlations, but after a few layers, you're able to learn like you know, non-local correlations you know, across the whole image. It just depends on you know how many layers and what the size of the filters are. But that's that's the job of the convolutional layers. And then when you get to the fully connected layers, it's like saying, okay, I have all this evidence. Like so, you know, at this point it's like translate all that spatial correlation into into Vectors that are useful for doing whatever the loss is trying to optimize for. So, you know, classification of this task, yeah, use all those features that are coming out to say, to notice that this is a dog or a cat or a car or whatever, right? So, I think that's kind of what you were getting at. And if it wasn't, at least you get an opportunity to say that, so thanks. <laughs> um, other questions? Okay, yeah, there are names given to these things which you probably can't review on this low resolution vector, but um, these are sort of like in between the pooling layers. The pooling layers, remember, give us um, a, reduction in the spatial, a reduction in the spatial dimensions of the, of the future maps. It also is a doubling the number of filters. This is pretty common in, in architectures um, after this. And there's just, you think of these as like stages, so comps, so like this is like the First stage, convolutional stage, second, third, fourth, and so and so on, and then uh, in the fully connected layer. So not that that matters too much, but there there is a, a convention for naming these things. Okay, so additional details about this. So like I said, it took second place in the classification task in 2014, but first place in localization. So definitely a, a you know great a great network that year. Um, you know how they trained it was similar to how, they, how Alex Net was trained. Um, 
Notice it does not have any of those normalization layers, those local response normalization layers. Um, they actually, you know, in the paper, they mentioned that they tried them, but it didn't help, so they got rid of them because they're very computationally uh, costly, and they already had 138 million parameters, so getting rid of a little bit of bulk was a good idea. Um, yeah, BGG 16 or 19 are the ones that reported in the paper, 19 is the one that was used for the submission. Uh, like in LXNet, they use ensembles of these results. So again, remember, I mean, the ensemble in here is to train, you know, a number of these, five, seven of these, and then take the soft max output of all of them, average them, and then do the prediction from the average soft max layer. That average soft max layer is again, it's the probability distribution, and you know, you just take the class with the highest uh, probability, and that's what your prediction is. And um, it does turn out that. That the like the final fully connected layer forty uh, so I mentioned forty ninety six before the softmax uh, fully connected layer of, of dimension one thousand. Mm -hmm. it, it turns out that that's actually useful for like lots of tasks. So like people often they just get started on something they don't need to train the network but they need they need to, to featureize an image. They'll just take the, the the trained weights from one of these guys, um, embed the image in this network. So just basically run inference on it. Just basically run the image from input, but not go all the way to the outputs and predict a class, but just use the 4096 dimensional vector as a representation, a low dimensional representation of the image. That doesn't feel very low dimensional. 4096 is pretty high, but it's, 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 a much lower, it's a much lower dimension than the actual image itself. And these are really useful for like all kinds of tasks. Then, um, just, just a, a comment about initialization. So I say it sort of use what's known as Xavier initialization. Row initialization, and I say sort of because when it was when it was trained, when, when the, like the, the the network that was submitted did not use this initialization. What it used was just like what AlexNet used, and what was kind of uh, popular at the time, which was again to like draw from a normal distribution and um, and then just have a slight bias in the positive direction because you got rarely and you wanted to have things slightly positive so that you could have some non-zero activation so you could get trained. Well, there was a technique developed by Floreau and Bengio um, in, in a paper in 2010 that is, it's a little more sophisticated than that. It's, it basically scales this up, um, just for, for lack of time, I'm just going to um, just get to the punchline as we get to the work on the So um, what we have here, we just have like a really simple network like this BGG. It doesn't have any pooling in it. It just has like, it just has um, 10, you can't have to see it. There's 10 hidden layers, and there's, and there's 10, let's see, there's 100 units in each of the layers. And um, we use just like the, 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 the very simple regular uh, um, initialization of you know, drawing from a random and just giving a slight positive bias to it. So what happens, so what you're seeing here, these are the histograms of the activations at each of the layers. So in your first layer, you know, things are looking good. You have like this Gaussian looking thing. So that's going to give you some variable. You're going to be able to learn with that. You're going to have non-zero gradients and such. But you see just like upon initialization, like in these upper layers, like all of these uh, histograms are basically centered at zero. It's like, or just slightly, it's, they're centered at the bias, just slightly above zero. Like there's not a lot of variability, there's not a lot of like differenti differentiating signal. So while this looks good, you know, at the beginning, you're gonna have, to, we're gonna have to, it's gonna take a while for them to develop any sort of significant sort of signal in these upper layers where we can start to learn. Um, Interesting features, and that slows down learning a ton. So they, um, what they did was to, they used this thing called Xavier initialization or Glorow initialization, because Glorow is uh, the, the first author in this paper where this was, uh, where this was shown, and instead of just drawing um, the, you know, the, the uh, from a standard normal, so just you know, from a distribution with means uh, zero, the standard deviation one for all the for all of the initial weights, they actually did this thing where they divided at each so for each layer they divided by the square root of the number of um, input neurons. That's what that fan in is the number of uh, input neurons into that layer. So this this of course depends that number fan in depends on which layer you're in, like how many 
how many uh, neurons there are, how many units there are in that amount there. And if you do that, then you see that you actually get this as the initial histograms in each of those layers. So instead of these things being uh, at zero, uh, these histograms being like very tightly distributed about zero or just slightly positive, what you have is that they're actually looking you know, more and more gassing with, with a lot more variability at all the layers. And this allows you to train much, much, much faster because, um, again, there's like a ton of signal there at the beginning. It's random signal, right? Like the, the weights are, are, are randomized, so it's not like this, the signal is basically noise, but at least like the gradients are not zero as a result of this, and like a lot of learning can happen. So, not a, like it's, you know, it's funny because it's from 2010, but like it, it was used here really effectively and was made really popular as a result. Uh, of that. So uh, this is like a typical initialization to do. Um, at least it was in 2014. Then there's another one that that, that comes out a little bit later um, that is used now because it's it's better for rhythms. And we'll talk about that later. Okay, so BGG, the submission that they made was actually an ensemble of seven models. And, and these are representations of the seven models, so they're a little bit funny to, to look at. If you read the paper, you'll understand the notation. But basically, this number is about the training data. So the 256, so this first number, for these three models, 256, these three numbers, 384, and then there's an interval here, five, 256 to 512. What that was was the, um, the length of the shortest size of the image. So you rescale the input image to have a shorter size of either 256 in these three models, 384 in these three models, or some like random choice between 256 and 512. And then they trained on crops, 224 by 224 crops with, of that rescaled image, kind of like what we saw in Alex that they actually went further into even more crops. And, um, and then they tested on crops of size 224, 256, and 288. Um, and that's what those numbers are there. And by doing that, they were able to get a, and assemble all those results together. They were able to get a top five error uh, rate on the test set of 7.3. So you can imagine, like, if you're them, you must be feeling good, right? Because the previous year was 11.7. This is 7.3. Like, you, you had, like, they had to have felt like, man, we're going to do this. Um, they have some post submission results. They actually kind of adapted this, this training procedure to, to get it down to actually 6.8, uh, the, the, the top five error rate is 6.8. However, unfortunately, Google Maps was also submitted that year, and it came in at 6.7. So, there, in the paper, when you read it, they're really magnanimous, and they, they, you know, they say, you know, good job, Google that. Um, and they also say, but, you know, remember that, like, in the, so, like in the end, you know, they, they have an ensemble of just two, like their, their best submission is just an ensemble of two models. Um, and this is an ensemble of like seven models, yeah, seven networks. And it's quite different. It's like, just remember that all we're doing is three by three convolutions. You know, we're just trying to prove a point. We really weren't trying to win, just trying to help science. <laughs> <laughs> but I must have smiled at the time. Okay. So, Google Net. Um, so, Google Net is a pretty massive departure. So, BGG is, a, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a lot like AlexNet in spirit, but, you know, there's some innovations there uh, in, in terms of the architecture, and they were able to get to a deep network of 19 layers. Uh, you know, eight layers was, was really deep the year before, and here they were at more than twice that, right? So, like, that's pretty awesome. Um, but then Google Net comes along, and they say, we need to go deeper. And actually, they actually quote this um, in the paper. <laughs> the picture isn't there. They say, like, we call this the inception model because there's a meme. And there's a meme saying, like, you know, we need to go deeper. So it's actually a quote. It's in the paper. It's academic. Thank you, Leonardo. Um, they have this, like, this totally new, bizarre way of well, it's not totally in there, but there's a little bit of history here, but they have this very bizarre model that comes out really bad on this. Well, I'll just point to everything. 
can say it multiple times. Um, but they have this very bizarre way of putting this um, network together. So there are 22 layers here, but um, there really are just a number, let's see how many, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's, a, there's nine of these layers within layers, these modules called inception modules, that they say allows them to go deeper. And there's, you know, there's some standard like convolutional stuff going on here, max pooling going on here, and there's some standard fully connected stuff going on, like average pooling at the end and, um, and fully connected layers at the end. But in between, basically, this network is just a bunch of these sub-networks put together. So, um, it turned, so this, like this, this final incarnation of, of uh, Google Net was really efficient in the sense that it only required five million, it, it only, so in these 22 layers, it only has five million parameters. So contrast that with 138 million, right? Um, so it says 12 less than Alex, 12 times less than AlexNet, but I guess five million into 138. 7B, what is that? Math is hard for me. 140, so it's like 280 times, or 28 times, I guess. Check me on that. Anyway, so approximately 28 times, so like, yeah, this is like way, 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 way smaller. Um, and therefore, you could go deeper. Uh, so there's 22 effective layers in this. That's not that much deeper than 19, uh, but still, uh, it, it's deeper. Okay, so what is this crazy inception module thing that, that this is built up out of? Where did it come from? Well, let's start, let's start looking at it. Oh yeah, by the way, this says there's no fully connected layers. It's true, except for there's one fully connected layer at the end to go to the soft max. Like, you always do that to be to, 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 to able to get the loss function. Okay, so. Um, Design a good local network topology, network within a network, and then stack these modules up there. So this is like at yeah, the core of what they were trying to do. Um, so they they do a really kind of fun job in this paper describing like the evolution of how they came up with these ideas. Um, but basically, they have they, they started off wanting to do the following. They wanted to have these sort of like okay, so this is this is the output from the previous layer, and up above is going to be the output from, from this set of things that's going to go, it's going to be input for the next module. And what you have here is like four parallel tracks. So you have, and this says one by one convolution, this says three by three convolution, this says five by five convolution, and this says uh, three by three max pooling. So you have these three, or you have these four different tracks would use the same input, the output from the previous layer, and it, would, it would, and it would just learn in parallel, one by one convolution, three by three, five by five, and then to do this max pooling, which doesn't have any trainable parameters, but we do this max pooling. And then the output of all these, you would just concatenate together, and that would be the output for the, for the input for the next module. Um, anybody see any issues with that right away? Wouldn't the dimension the next y not match up? Yeah, so I don't know what you mean by x and y, but if you mean like this is x and this is y, yeah, they don't match up. Yeah, they don't match up. It's actually like which one's bigger? Um, Freaks there would be bigger, right? <clears throat> the one was bigger. The output is essentially like, it, it, especially in terms of number of filters, it's, it's got four times number of filters. You don't change the number of filters in these convolutions here. You just, if, you're, if you preserve the number of filters, then you have four times the number of filters going, going in. So it's like, it's getting huge. So that's a problem that needs to be dealt with. Um, what else is seem strange about this? But it doesn't have to be strange. Like just, what do you, what do you notice about this? What, what seems interesting about this? Like how do you concatenate filters together Okay, there's, there, there's that issue, but of course, we can control that with padding and, you know, getting the spatial, you know, like, like so there's not, everything here is a stripe one, so we're basically preserving the, the, the spatial output. But yeah, there's that. Um, 
Like why why not just choose one? Why why one why one by one, why three by three, why five by five? Why have these modules built up this way? Well, the paper has this really cool discussion around around this. And um, basically it's the following. They they what they what the art the argument they're making is when when learning when learning to extract spatial correlation in these images, you know, if you look at an image, basically like most of the correlation is very local, it, you know, just like in, in, in the raw image. It's very, very local, right? So like, you know, if, I, if you give me a, a, a pixel and tell me its color, I can predict that color for the nearby pixels and usually do quite well because that, those, are, that those are very spatially correlated, right? you know, notions of color and intensity and shading and you know, all, all these kinds of things. Um, and, and a one by one is like the most extreme sort of uh, capturing of, of, of local spatial correlation. In fact, it captures no spatial correlation except for in the direction of the channel, right? So remember that a one by one uh, convolution is um, nothing more than doing like a linear combination of the, the channels and using filters over the top of your image. You're just looking at you know that three by three or five by five or one, one by one in this case, and you're just looking down and just doing um, linear combinations of the values in the channel direction or the filter direction. So, yeah, so like that's the most extreme. So like these things are, are, are there to like capture early on local spatial correlation. But, you know, as, as convolutions progress, you know, and, and as this image is sort of getting, um, you know, spatially, like the spatial dimensions being reduced, then correlations at larger scales, like three by three and then, and then five by five are becoming more important because you're now getting an opportunity to learn spatial correlations between things that are far apart from each other. I mean, you could do this with like the original image, but you have to have like a very, very large filter, right? And that's computationally infeasible. So they basically just have like a way of, with each of these modules, of, of letting the network decide at which, at which spatial correlation to, to learn, like what, which spatial correlation to learn in this module. It basically it learns all of them, but the, the, the reason that they put it together this way was just like given this notion. And it has some correlation like the way brains do work, and that's how they motivate it. That's really where it comes from. And um, so, let's see. Question yeah. If you add a seven by seven convolution, do you see your better? Um, I don't know the answer because I don't know if I've ever seen that. Um, but yeah, it would give you one more, it would give you one more spatial um, uh, one more spatial size in the correlation. <coughs> I don't I don't know the answer to that. I don't think I've seen that, but I, it, it the answer is going to be like literally along the lines of like the answer I gave earlier about you know, you're adding capacity to the network so you can do better on the training data. That may or may not generalize to, to, to test set. But yeah, like you could, you could with these notions kind of keep going. But there's always this balance between like how much capacity to have in the network and you know how, how that affects um, how, like your ability to memorize the training data over just learning the important features. So, so that's like a very natural thing to do. It's not clear why they stopped at five by five and then did seven by seven, but especially with, since there's only five million parameters, and, you know, BGG was using 138. Right? So you figure that they have a little bit of space to spare. But seven by sevens are, are thought of as being like really computationally well, just like generally, and so I think people just generally avoid them, um, except that they're often used as like at the first computational layer. So. Um, yeah, so, so, so putting some numbers to the sum of the thing I just said. So what's the problem with, like, with this module, what's called the naive inception module, as it is? Well, if you're going to put 28 by 28 by 256, so remember, 28 by 28 spatial, 256 number of channels and filters. Um, and then each of these convolutions is telling you, you know, how, many, how many filters you're learning in the 1 by 1, the 3 by 3, and the 5 by 5. Again, it's just like hyperparameters. It's not clear why it's 128, 192, 196, but just Let's just say we, we chose those. Um, so what's the output size of the one by one with 128 filters? 28 by 28 by? 28. <coughs> exactly. How about for uh, 
the other filters, the three by three and the five by five. Six by So like, like I told you, if you use padding, I use padding in this, so you get the same number of, you know, since spatial dimensions remain the same, strike one and yeah. enough padding to, to preserve the spatial dimensions. So 28 by 28 by 192, 28 by 28 by 96, and then this is a this is a pooling uh, with strike one, so again 20 by 28 by the number, the original number of filters, 256. So spatially we can we can put these all together because they're all the same spatial dimensions, but then you have all of these, uh, like we said before, like all of uh, these filters, 128 by 182 by 96 by 256. So, uh, so, at, so the final output here, if you were just to do this naively, we have 28 by 28 by 672. That's 128 plus 192 plus 96 plus 256. So yeah, so it went from, from 20, 28 by 28 by 256 to 28 by 28 by 672. So like this is getting bigger as we go. That's, that's not, Necessarily bad, but if you're just kind of naively like stacking these things on top, like you're just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, um, and that's not good. So um, there's also like a ten operations involved in here, so you know, multiplies and adds. 854 million apparently, approximately, in, in, in those three convolutions. Not, there's, yeah, not mentioning the maxes and things like that. So that's very expensive, and yeah. So how do we deal with this? Well, we use one by ones as like, a, it, it's often referred to as a bottleneck layer, but it's a way of just, we, if we use a one by one proceeding like these guys, for instance, we have a way of reducing the number of filters from 256 to something else before we then do spatial um, uh, convolutions. And that's what's done here. So this is just to say like, hey, remember one by ones? We can, we can basically go from like, we, we preserve the spatial dimensions, but we can go from any number of channels to any number of channels. We just choose the number of uh, filters to learn and then we'll learn So that's what we that's what's done here in the actual like efficient conception model is to prior to um, entering um, in, into the three by three and the five by five convolutions, uh, we do a one by one convolution to reduce the number of filters coming to us from the from the output layer, of the, of the, from the output of the previous layer, and also to do the same thing, you be able to control the number of filters. We do one by one after the three by three max pool. So these are these are these are used simply to be able to control the number of filters in the output. So yeah, so in this, if we go back to this uh, original problem where we have. We, in these one by ones that we've added, if we use um, 64 filters, then um, these things these things don't change necessarily up here, but like this changes right here, and you can change up to 480. This is kind of a bad example actually, because we actually do change these to to match. So, so basically, what we do is we, we we can make it have exactly the same number of filters in the output as in the input. But the point is, is like you can really drastically um, reduce the number of operations. In, in doing this, and this is this is great when you have a big deep model. Excuse me. Yeah. Is that a question? Yeah. So why can't we just have like less number of filters in the three by three itself? Yeah, that's actually it is typically less there. So it's it's, it's kind of a funny example. <laughs> um, this is what happens when you use somebody else's slide. Um, but it's like instead of using the one by one. So there's so there's there's there, so there's two there's two reasons for it. One is um, the convolution itself, so, so this, is, this is definitely true no matter what you do. So like, remember this is what we were at the beginning. Well, I guess we didn't care. So like, this is what we were at the beginning. So when we do the one by one um, to 64 channels, when we, when we do the three by three convolution, it's still over a 28 by 28, but the, but the, the, the number of uh, filters or the number of channels that it's doing the convolution on is, instead of it being 256, it's now 64. So the reduction, like the reduction number of operations, mainly comes from things like that. Like, um, let's see, three by three by, by one ninety two. You see, the, the the number of operations, like here before this was a two fifty six, and now it's sixty four. So it's reduced by a factor of four. So yeah, the, the three by three is can be computed on less number of times. 
Exactly. The three by threes, you're still learning 192 filters like in this yeah. choice of parameters, but it, it, to, to learn each of those parameters, it takes a fourth less operations. <clears throat> and yeah, and then, you, and then you know, the one by one on this other side is simply just to reduce the number of filters uh, going into the combination. So when you add one by one bottleneck, like convolutional layers, um, do you leave them all for like the same depth, so like 64 in this instance? Do you learn the same number of filters in each layer, or does it matter? It's like one of those things, right? It's like maybe you get to choose. <laughs> like you just choose this because like at some point your brain starts hurting. Like I don't want to. I don't want that to be something different than that. Yeah. Okay, so basically you take those those modules, you stack them up, and voila, you have this powerful, uh, very strange kind of network inside of a network um, architecture. And um, there was there there was there was a paper that came out prior to, to this that was called Network and Network. That was basically putting like uh, it was putting layers inside of layers like convolutional layers in between fully connected layers and things like this, and they're kind of playing around with that. It's a precursor to this. That's no longer used. It's actually literally called network and network, but this is stuck around. And it's still used quite a bit, but um, but really it's all not, like basically most of using residual networks at this point because they do perform so much better. Um, okay, so here's that same network laid on the side. Fortunately, we're going from left to right so that people know we're in the in-group. Um, so this is just like really, really simple start. Like so, it's like convolutional, convolutional layer pool, two convolutional layers in pool, um, and then it, and that goes into the, the inception modules. There's one other thing on here. Well, there's the, there's uh, yeah. So there's the modules. There's the classifier output, right? So this goes like this is, a, this is a pooling. It's an average pooling layer. To take the spatial dimensions, reduce those down to just one uh, dimension or one. Like a one by one essentially, so you just have a vector that can then connect to your soft max layer. But then you see um, you see these interesting things. So I don't know if any of you saw these and were like still like, is he ever gonna say anything about this? Um, so what these are are, as it says here in the notes, these are auxiliary classification outputs. So basically, each one of these is trying to do the exact same task, solve the, the exact same optimization problem as the loss function all, all the way up here. There, there are, there is a, there's a pooling, there's fully connected layers, and then there's softmax. And to get, to be able to train this network and have it go as, as deep as it is, they found that to get, like to speed up the training, they needed to basically inject additional signal in the earlier layers because it was sort of weakening as it was back propagated through the network. So they fixed that by, by making, like, you know, basically like thinking about the network from you know, input to like here and then output, like making that a classifier, and then input to here and output another classifier and input. They're all trying to do exactly the same classification task. They're just using different features from the different, level, from the different layers here with which to do that classification task. And basically what that's doing is just providing additional grading. So like, so like if, you're, if you're here, um, the gradient you, you, um, you receive in back propagation, so like the upstream gradient, is a combination of the gradient coming from this loss, and back propagated through all these modules, from this loss, and through the, and back propagated through those modules, and then this loss. So it's just, it's like the sum of all those gradients. So, What's really cool about neural networks is that you can do this kind of thing. Um, you can just like have multiple tasks, and you know here that it's like they're, they're trying to do all the same uh, thing. But as as we go into more complicated networks, you'll see like it's it's very common to have to 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 have multiple loss losses that um, that you're optimizing jointly to do different types of tasks with the same features from you know the Nintendo network. So. That's how this is done. If you if you go and you know to a, to a to a deep learning framework and go look at this, the implementation of this, you'll see these things there, and you'll think, oh, that is really cool. 
Um, yeah, so 22 to total layers. So the layers that are in the auxiliary outputs are not connected. Okay, so this was a reminder, 22 layers, 5 million parameters, no fully connected layers, at least not the main parameters. There are, there are a couple of the auxiliary branches. And this got us 6.7% top 5 and uh, error rate in 2014. Um, interestingly, uh, they quickly followed up with a bunch of really impactful uh, papers. So right after this, so so Google Net is, is, is an inception model. It's like, you think it was inception version 1, but it's always called Google Net. But then they started publishing a, a series of papers where they added additional techniques that we use, not just in, in Google Net or inception type models, but in other, uh, uh, other networks as well for training them. And one of the most important ones here is what's called batch normalization. So um, batch normalization is the following. So, um, as you're training a network, so if you just think about like, okay, just you have all these layers, let's just pick you know, some layer and just look at the activations coming down that layer. And think about the distribution of activation. So at first that's some distribution, and then over time it changes to be some other distribution. And basically that can, you know, you can expect that it might stabilize, but it can, it can continue to wander. So like the, the yeah, the distribution, like pattern of activations that are that are that are that are coming out of this layer, that can change over time. And, and if you think about that, that makes it really hard for the next layer to learn from that because the the like distribution of data is is changing. Like you know, if you think about like the initial the initial data, like you know, the images, like those don't change. But if you think about from the perspective of in, of, of individual layers. Those can really change, and that's called. Um, it has a term called it's covariate shift, internal covariate shift when you're thinking about like with between layers. Um, so yeah, it's so like this distribution of the of the output that the next layer is trying to learn from is changing. That makes it very challenging to learn, and it's it's a it's a it's a source of, um, of noise and slows down slows down learning. So these guys are like, maybe we can do something about. So, um, so you may so so the first thing you might decide to do is like okay let's let's try to make these all have like a kind of distribution. So let's like if we just do something simple here like um, make make for each for each batch compute the batch mean and the batch standard deviation and just standardize the out, the outputs the activations then. You know, I have something that's a little more, at least at the batch level, for like that's for that um, subpopulation of the of, of all the uh, of all the activations from from each of, like from all the input data. Um, we can make at least at that level, we can make it have zero mean and unit variance or standard deviation. Um, and and so this is what they tried to do. And what's nice here is that this is actually. Like easily differentiable, right? It's just a couple of their arithmetic operations, and so we we're like, yeah, we could actually, we could actually learn right through this. So it could, we could, you know, we could have normalization occur and we could be learning end to end. Um, they actually, um, they actually went a little bit further. I should use this slide here. Um, they went a little bit further and said, okay, well, um, it may be that we want to learn this distribution right here. And this is a comment about where the batch normalization normally goes um, after, your, after your activations. But it may be that, um, yeah, it may be that we don't necessarily want this distribution. Like it's not, we, we want it to be like the, the, we want it to be like one distribution always, but it may not be that this is like this, you know, zero mean unit variance distribution is like what we really want. Um, maybe it's slightly different from that. So, um, when you, you introduce a couple of uh, trainable parameters, learnable parameters here, is you take this standardized um, uh, input, so it's standardized by the statistics at the mini batch or the batch, and then you actually learn a scaling of that 
and a bias term on that. So you basically just learn this linear map with gamma and beta. Um, and if this thing really wants to learn standard, um, or yeah, if it really wants to have it be like uh, zero mean and unit variance, then it can learn gamma to be the variance, uh, or the square root of the variance, square root of the variance, and beta to learn the, uh, the mean there, and it can, um, or sorry, I said that wrong. If it wants to learn it for the, it to have to be zero mean and unit variance, then it could learn this to be a one and that to be a zero. If it wanted just the original distribution, it could learn this to be the square root of the variance and this to be the mean, and we go right back to the original value x. So this just allowed it to be like a little more flexible to allow it to learn, um, just you know, sort of sort of standardize um, the, the 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 activations at, at, at every layer. Uh, before they went into the next layer. And this like seems kind of weird and kind of simple, but it turns out like this is like amazingly powerful. And basically like all convolutional networks now use batch normalization or something akin to batch normalization to to in, in between, again, like right after the activations of, of every like convolutional layer. And actually and, and fully connected layer. I mean like everywhere. Like it's just it's so useful because again what it's doing is that it's make, it's sort of it's trying really hard to make the distribution that's coming like the, the distribution of activations you know at every layer to be the same every every time every time you train every iteration it's trying to make it the same like at first it's like different but then it converges to something and then this is so now you know again the 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 down the the the, the, the upstream layer it's it, it doesn't have to like learn, like for instance, like if, if the mean's always the same, it doesn't have to like relearn that mean. If the variance is always the same, it doesn't have to relearn that variance. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to like learn the shift there. It can now learn more interesting statistics from the distribution and, and extract those to the next layer. So it's like, it's so powerful. Do you have a question? So will it be correct to say that since you're adding normalization just before the railing step, so so most of the, all the signals are like centered about zero. So about half of the signals will be like chopped off. It, by it's not before the radio step, it's after the activations. Oh, okay, so yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's whatever the activations are, then, then you do this. Of course, people actually switch this up and they do sometimes with the batch norm before the activation. I mean, like, people now kind of play around with this, but essentially this, this step at every layer really speeds up training. Really, like this is like the most effective thing for speeding up training, uh, besides being a really great player. So you want to make sure you said the best model is after the activation, but on the slide, I think it's before. No, these are after. So before non. Oh, these errors are going down, yeah. Oh, I see. It is like that in this, right? Well, it's, it's typical to do it after the activation. That's funny. Yeah, you're right, it is like right here. Um, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> At this point, I don't know what to tell you. I, I, so I guess it's probably very it's probably true that in the training of the um, uh, Google Net that um, this was done this way, but it is far more common now to put that for the activation. Okay. So so this, so this, this is the, te the technique, and it's like again, it's super powerful, and um, for all the reasons that we just, we just, we just described here. And again, like like everything else, it acts like regularization. It, um, yeah, this even says like maybe reducing the input dropout. That, that that may be the case. It's not clear that that's actually true, but it's it, like I said, it's. Like, Really, 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 really powerful. It makes it so that you don't have to get the initialization totally right either, because like it, it immediately like creates these distributions and tries to fix them to be the same distribution every time. So it kind of fixes that. So there's one there's one additional issue that we haven't talked about, and that is you, you like calculate these these means and these standard deviations at the uh, during training on, for each batch. But what what do you do during test time? The so test time, you know, you like you don't want you don't want the, the result to be dependent on a batch. Like you want to be make, making a prediction per um, 
per image or per sound. So, um, so what is done, um, and there's like there's like different variants in this, but like what's typically done is just to keep a running average of the parameters gamma and beta. So usually like some sort of um, exponential average. Um, so at first they're going to change a lot, but over time they're going to stabilize. And if you keep this exponential average, then um, you know, that's some good approximation to, 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 to what this is likely trying to be, uh, or what it needs to be. And if you just use the exponential, the, the exponential average, um, exponential weighted average of gamma and beta at test time, then it's not, again, those are not going to be dependent on So that's nice too. It's pretty easy. There's there's different ways, there's like different kinds of batch normalization. Like here's one that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, if we, if we if what I just showed you is like thinking about it like entry wise, but of course if you do that, then you're 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 essentially thinking of like you're not taking into account the correlations between features within the uh, um, within that layer. And you can take that into account. You can actually learn a full covariance matrix and do your normalization this way. And that also has like it's like it performs slightly better, but it's it's not like way better where it's just worth the computation, right? Because here you're learning like two n or you're, you're learning like n parameters, and there you're learning n squared parameters. Well, it's, there's symmetry in that matrix, but it's on the order of n squared, so it's not it's it's way more you know, expensive. Okay, so batch normalization, totally useful. And then, um, then they had a third variant, this version three, where um, they like factorized the, the filter. So instead of like having a three by three filter, they would have a one by three filter and a three by one filter. And like, if you think, again, like if you think about it, if you stack those things together, you can get receptive fields that you know, are like the original three by threes, uh, or what you know, five by fives, whatever you're going for. And so, like, they were really trying to aggressively, like, re remove the parameters. Every time you do this factorization, you remove the number of three parameters you learn. And it turns out that, that version three um, is quite powerful. It works quite well. Um, in fact, um, the top five error rate is a three point five eight. And that's lower than the human rate, which is, you know, it's like, um, this, this came out in 2016, so this is, this is after ResNet did, did essentially the same thing, but um, yeah, just adding batch norm, there's a couple of, uh, of additional, like, tricks in terms of, like, how to do the, the test time evaluation and things like that, but doing that in aggressive factorization, allowing you to have deeper networks, um, you got these really amazing top five. Questions? Okay. I, I wanted to throw this sort of segue into here before we, we go on to residents, which we'll do uh, next time. And I, I forgot to mention this, I came in late, but um, I, I'm not going to be here on Thursday, and Alessandro is going to be teaching about TensorFlow. I use TensorFlow. Uh, so come in, come in, come in. Uh, and learn about TensorFlow. Uh, and then when I get back, we'll do, uh, the, we'll do the rest of this. We'll talk about years 15, 2015, 2016, 2017, and, and all the variants of what those guys have. But in the last couple minutes that we have here, I just want to mention a couple of other uh, update rules for gradient descent. So you remember we talked about gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent with momentum, and we talked about uh, Nestor rock momentum. So there's there's even more. <laughs> um, and one uh, one uh, one um, update rule that uh, is it's not really used because there's like a variant of this that's that's used that is that's far more powerful. But one that's sort of like um, is the is a I don't know how to say it, like, kind of like the first in like a whole line of, of, of these uh, types of um, optimization rules is what's called adagrad. That's like short for adaptive gradient. 
And it looks just like um, stochastic gradient descent. It's just that instead of um, just updating with the gradient, so you have this you know, learning rate times the gradient, you actually divide by the gradient squared. So this is this. This is um, well, the square root of, let's see. Yeah, the, the square root of the gradient squared. So this, what do I have that written like that? Oh, yeah, this is, okay, this just makes it seem common, right? So, um, so what, what's happening is it's looking at the gradient and it's, it's dividing by the size of the gradient, like the, the absolute value of the size of the gradient um, before doing the update. So what does that do? So it's called adaptive gradient. What does that do? Well, what happens if your gradient is really large? If you divide by it, what happens? It's going to get smaller. And if it's smaller, then it's going to get larger. So what this is doing is it's like um, sort of reweighting the, the, the steps to, um, to, to, to make like the, the the, the rates at which you, you learn in each direction more equal to each other. And um, yeah, so it's like, again, like we're going in some sort of steep direction, um, that, gets, that, gets temp that gets tempered, and if we're in some sort of flat direction, then that gets sort of augmented. So we, we're, we're taking steps that are like sort of equal in, in all the dimensions. And it's not like an awesome technique, the, 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 the one, the, the credit, the, let's see what that, <laughs> the ones that come after it are far more powerful, but it's interesting. It's an interesting idea. So, um, just because I've got just five minutes, I want to uh, go get to the next uh, variants of this. So, Adagrad adaptive gradient does what we just described. There is a version of this called RMS Prop. I have no idea what's called RMS Prop. Um, in fact, it's not even published. It's like in some. It's in like one of Jeff Hinton's merits for his class and it has some slides somewhere. That's like what gets, that's, that's like what gets uh, um, cited if you want to cite this. But um, it just basically, it just, it just like, in, it has a momentum term for the, for the square decay. Um, and so that's like, there, there's that variant which is kind of nice, like it you know, has like some of the nice properties of, 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 of momentum kind of smooth out that term out. And just a reminder, we saw this before, but um, remember we had SGD, which is this total slow poke trying to get to the um, to the minimum. You have momentum and Nesterov momentum doing this kind of strange thing over here, being the momentum. But then Adagrad, Ada Delta is very similar to Adagrad, so this is slight random I haven't mentioned here. And RMS Prop, notice that they um, they actually they actually don't, they arrive in like this example slightly after uh, momentum and Nesterov momentum, but they don't take this like wild uh, job over here, uh, mainly because it, you know, this is like this, like when they were over here, like this was the, the, the direction, like steepest descent, and they, you know, for, for momentum and Nesterov uh, momentum, if you take big steps in that direction, but when you renormalize those, the, the size of the steps, notice that like Adagrad and RMS prof don't, they, they, they take like more reasonable size steps every time. So an interesting, an interesting idea. And then finally, this is, a, this is an, up, an update mode that's used a lot, a lot, a lot. Basically, SGD plus momentum and atom are used all the time. And, and atom is, um, atom is like these um, adaptive gradient methods. Um, but it, it um, has these correction terms. So it does have a momentum term, um, a standard momentum term for the gradient. It has this other momentum term for the square of the gradient. And um, it has this additional like correction term. Oh, it's not quite on here yet. And yeah, what, does it have, what happens in the first time step? So, I'll just cut to the chase. There's a bias. So at the first time step, the moments are basically zero. So like this. So at first, like everything's dominated by. Um, so it's like so. 
These estimates up here are actually biased estimates because the bias towards zero it, it, it wouldn't be initialized. But if we sort of correct for that by doing this division by beta one and beta two, which are these exponential weighted parameters, then what we get is this unbiased estimate of those of those moments. Um, and and what you get is a really 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 powerful um, update rule. And honestly, like if you're you know if, if you're ever like starting on something, usually SGD and momentum are better, but this will get you a long ways, honestly, just choosing these parameters for beta one in the first moment estimation, beta two in the second moment estimation, and then the, the, a learning rate of 10 to the minus three or five to the minus four. And, and yeah, you will, you, will see, you will see learning happen almost surely. Um, all right, so I just have I just have one minute left to mention the following. So, in all of these on all of these update rules, learning rate is a hyperparameter, right? Like it's just one of the parameters to tune. So, like how do you choose the best one? Um, learning rate is like one of the most important parameters to get right in terms of like actually training a network to do something useful. So you know, uh, here's like a characterization of what might happen. You know, like I might have, you know, good learning rate is something where, you know, quickly over time we we get down to 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 low loss here. But like if my learning rate is too high, remember if I take like two bigger steps, I could actually like not, I could I can I had I could have a hard time getting into like narrow wells within the loss surface. For a low learning rate, I might be able to get to those to those low those those deep wells, but it might take me a long time. Yeah, very high learning rate, I might go in the opposite direction. Taking my just random steps and not, not converging anything, but um, but yeah. So so you have to tune it. And there's like this is really there is really no like other technique for learning, for, for the learning rate other than just like to pick something and, and and to do some tuning, like train train a couple of networks with different learning rates just to see how things behave. A very typical thing to do though is to decay the learning rate over time. There's two techniques for that, exponential decay and this one over t type decay. This is, this, is, this is used all the time, this is not used. And this has like some bad properties I don't really understand, but this is what's used. Um, so what's happening is like just over, just for every epoch, you're basically making your learning rate slightly smaller so that you, you, know, you can start with like a kind of a higher learning rate and explore the space. Um, and then over time, you get to a lower learning rate so that you can maybe like um, get into deeper wells in the lost surface. Um, the other thing to do is to find that out there. The other thing to do is um, to, to do this kind of thing where if your loss starts to plateau, to then drop your learning rate by a tenth. And we saw this in a couple of the networks we looked at. This is a really common technique, is to like is to monitor the loss. If that actually ever plateaus, then drop your learning rate by some like divide by 10, divide by 8, or something like that. And then do that every time it drops, uh, every time the, the, the plateaus. And that, that really allows you to, to get into you know, deeper wells. And usually we'll get a couple of extra percentage uh, points of accuracy or you know, reduce the loss. Okay, there are some second order techniques that we don't need to talk about because no one uses them, it's really expensive. But they're named after the pretty cool old guys like that. And yeah, that's, oops, that's it. That's <coughs> So, to end, um, really, like, if you're just starting off with something, you should probably just use that. Like, it's in, it's in all the people in the packages. It's easy, to, it's easy to use. It's usually fast. It has some issues, um, and but it, you know, for, for, for most things, it's a great default choice. But almost everything that like wins a competition or something is trained with SGD momentum, so people take some time. To like tune the to, to, to tune SGD plus the tune the learning rate, tune the momentum parameter, and really get uh, really get a good result there. Yeah. And if you want to do a secondary method, you could do it, but like it doesn't like it makes no sense for the monsters and every trade. Okay, so that's it. Thanks guys.